Voice Vision Holocaust Survivor Oral History Archive uh, that was started by Professor Sidney Volkowski back in the early 1980s. We began working with the HMC and then we moved over to Dearborn. I'm reading his book right now. Are you? So, first of all, I want to back up exactly what Guy said about the, the, the Poles who saved Jews. And I, I, I agree, I think it should be Christian Poles who saved Polish Jews, or however you want to, uh, to, to put that. I was thinking when I was prepping for this a little bit about the trip I had taken to Poland two years ago. It was a study abroad trip. We took some students. And on the way to Treblinka, we had a local guide. And I had asked this, this local Pole, because he kept talking about Jews and Poles as if they were two very different almost nationalities. I asked several times, Spencer was in the bus, and I asked this guy like three or four times, well, were the, Pol were the Jews not Polish citizens? And he just refused to answer. Uh, somewhere in his mind, and I think in many people's minds in Poland, there's still this separation, which I think really needs to be unseparated and brought back together at some point. But that's, I think, a different topic. Um, JJ was nice enough to send me some questions. So I will kind of go through my answers to these a little bit. Um, so the first one was, do we know how many Poles actually saved Jews, and is it possible to count all of them, not only the ones that are included among the righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem? Now I looked it up, 6,620 Poles are recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. It's estimated that 30,000, between 30,000 and 35,000 Polish Jews, 1% of the population were saved. Which is, when you think about it, is seems small, but uh, the nature of the on the Nazi onslaught against the Polish Jewry was unprecedented. Uh, so to even have been able to say one percent of that population was remote. But we'll never know the full number. We'll never know how many. As Guy said, there's many for every Irina Sendler, or if you want to take it outside of Poland, every Oscar Schindler, every Nicholas Winton. There were maybe three or four polls that no one's ever heard of that, without institutional help or institutional backing, uh, were successful in saving polls. So why will we never know that full, the full reason? Why will we never know? And I think the answer to this lies in the reasons for why polls hid Jews or didn't hide Jews. And I think there's a hundreds of different reasons. I'll just go through a couple. And I, I guess I should start first one of the reasons, and I'm not uh, naive enough to, to leave this out, and I don't think we should kid ourselves. Greed and opportunism. Okay, and that, that happened. It didn't just happen in Poland. It was widespread geographically, and probably not as prevalent as we suspect, but certainly there were Gentiles, including Poles, who took advantage of Jews for monetary gain. I think of uh, a local survivor, Irene Miller, whose family escaped into the Soviet Union uh, and survived the war, different Holocaust experience than some survivors, but nevertheless, I think a Holocaust experience. And she tells a story of her parents who lived in Warsaw, paid a Gentile, a Pole, to take them to the border, to the demarcation line with the Soviet Union, and get them across the border. And she talks about how this guy took them there and kind of unceremoniously dumped them, and they weren't at the board. They were in kind of a no man's land in between the two, and they were forced to stay for six weeks in the wintertime, in the open air, because this particular poll took their money and ran. Now, I don't want to, again, say that this is a strictly a Polish phenomenon. It's European widespread. So I think people that did it for kind of greed or some kind of gain economically were not really going to report themselves to Yad Vashem after the war to say, look, I saved these Jews, they gave me some money, and yeah, I didn't really do what I said I was going to do. Or the people they rescued were probably not so inclined to report them to Yad Vashem, at least to paint them in any kind of positive light. But I also think it's important that we look at the risks involved in saving Jews. God bless us all. In Poland, it was the death penalty on the spot. So to even take money from a Jew, maybe your, your motivations aren't necessarily in the right place, but the risk, I think, in many ways, probably far outweighed any reward that they got. 
Now, let's get away from that because that is not a pleasant thing to talk about. Other reasons, the religious morality, people's upbringing. Catholicism certainly played a positive role in Poland regarding rescuing, rescuing of the Jews. I'm a very, very far last Catholic. Sorry, it's my Polish friends. Um, so I, that's never been a role in my life. But I want to say in Poland, and not just in Poland, in Europe again, it played a role, a positive role, but not a big enough role. Not only in Poland, but Europe as well. I did some little some research. According to Pew Research Center, the Roman Catholic population of Europe was nearly 189 million in 1910, 65% of the population of the Roman Catholic. So it's a widespread population. The Catholic Church has a very rigid hierarchy. It's uh, decentral, it's centralized, but it's decentralized in smaller locations. And certainly from Pope Pius XII on down, more could have been. This all, however, though, can be said of the Protestant Church as well. The German Protestant Church has a, an abysmal record of at least turning a blind eye to the Holocaust and to the plight of the Jews in Germany, at least. But to take it even farther, instead of the Poles who say Jews, nobody did anything. Okay? Some people did. But they didn't do enough. Look at the Allied powers. Okay, it's one thing to say, well, we could have, they could have done this, or they could have parachuted in, or blah, 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 whatever you want to call it. But they had ample opportunity to know what was coming, at least in some ways, and to do certain things they could have, they could have done certain things, to if not outright stop it, to at least slow it down. The Avion Conference of 1938 was a joke, where the Allied powers met and talked about the plight of the Jews in Germany, and came up with some kind of weakly worded uh, guy by those it wasn't exactly a strong statement. They could have, the United States could have eased immigration quotas, which they refused to do, mostly at the behest of an assistant uh, undersecretary of state, a guy named Breckenridge Long, if you've heard of him. He actually actively put obstacles in the way of Jewish immigration into the United States. I have a quote here. He writes a memo in June 1940. Uh, about opening up the borders. And this is, quote, we can delay and effectively stop for a temporary period of indefinite length the number of immigrants in the United States. We can do this by simply advising our councils to put every obstacle in the way and to require additional evidence and to resort to various administrative devices which would postpone and postpone and postpone the granting of visas. As early as uh, 1941, British intelligence had been intercepting the Einsatzgruppen reports. So they, in the Einsatzgruppen reports, very openly discussed the massacre of Jews and so Obviously, they could have bombed Auschwitz. There's many things that could have been done outside of Poland by non-Poles, outside of Europe by non-Europeans, that could have helped save Jews. So, if we were to look at this wonderful exhibit and some of the examples like I spoke of and I have a couple as well. Uh, you should think about altruism. I'm a little out of my field here. I'm not a psychologist. I probably should have done that. Make more money back. <laughs> but what is altruism? First of all, it's directed towards helping another person. It involves a high risk or sacrifice to the person that is doing the helping. It is accomplished and accompanied by no external reward. It's voluntary. And in all those ways, normal everyday Poles helped normal everyday Polish Jews to survive, to escape. This altruism and these reasons for helping cut across socioeconomic lines and religious affiliations, especially in Poland. And I would add, I think, you know, those who helped for selfless reasons did so out of the selfless concern for others. JJ asked me that what kind of help was given to Jews by Poles. Uh, it runs the gamut. 
to uh, all sorts of things, all dangerous. But they range from, in some cases, tossing food over the ghetto walls and camp fences, fighting Jews, fighting Jewish fighting groups, especially the ZOB and the Warsaw Ghetto, with arms and ammunition to rise up. JJ said that another question would be, who are the most famous Polish righteous and what are their stories? Uh, you know, Irina Sandler always comes to mind in the last five or ten years. That story has become very popular and kind of ballooned. And that's, uh, that's awesome. But I want to talk more about the unsung heroes, the people that we don't know about that Guy mentioned, who, with no help, no reason, other than altruism, helped Jews, hit Jews, saved them, gave them food. So we have one, Stefa Kupfer, a survivor that was interviewed by our archive, who was saved, along with her mother and her sister, by a Jewish woman named Mrs. All I know is Mrs. Olefsta, her first name. I tried to look up to see if she was among the righteous of the nations. I think she is, but I couldn't put the names together because of the different phonetic spellings. Uh, she, the family was then later helped by a Polish farmer named Wierczbici. So, I mean, these are people who had no reason they didn't gain anything by helping uh, Stefan or her family. Another person Guy probably knows is Miriam munchek wotkoczka Ferver, who was born in Sosnowiec in 1942. Family was then moved to the ghetto on the outskirts of the city. And Miriam's mother asked her friends, Josef and Stanisław Wotkoczka, uh, who were a Polish family, former neighbors and friends, uh, the Munkacz, uh, Munchek's. Munkacz. No, no, Munchek, not Munkacz, not the Rebbe. To take care of the infant Miriam until her mother could return from her. And her mother and the rest of her family were more than likely sent to one of the Operation Reinhardt death camps, gassed. So Miriam spent the remainder of the war in the care of the watch customers. The family portrayed her as the illegitimate daughter of the oldest Wokuchka daughter and was raised as a Polish Catholic. Now think about this. this is very strict Catholic country, this is the 1940s, to put the reputation of your eldest daughter on the line saying she had an illegitimate child that we are now raising. And to, to use that as the cover story takes an awful lot of good to borrow a phrase. Courage. So, why is this important? I was thinking about that as a historian and a professor or teacher of Holocaust history or any kind of history. I always try to convey to my students, why is it important? Why do we care about Napoleon? Why do we care about any of this stuff? Right? What does it have to do with your life? Sometimes it's easier than others. Sometimes it's harder than others. And I think a lot, especially in today's day and age, that we need to be more altruistic to each other. Guy doesn't know me that well, some of you do. I don't generally tend to try to find anything positive in the Holocaust. There's not really much there to find. But this idea that there were people in Poland and elsewhere who were willing, for no reason other than the good of their heart, to help others is an important lesson, especially today. We, as a society, I'm afraid, are becoming more and more divided and atomized tend to not see the good in other people or to want to put ourselves out in any way to help other people. And so if there is a lesson to be learned from the Holocaust, I think this is one of the few that, that we can take and, 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 and take with us and use into the future. There's the anti-bullying thing and people sometimes like that, sometimes they don't. But this idea that we all need to be nicer to each other in one way or another, and especially I have a funny feeling Things might get a little hairy, I don't know. So I think if there's a lesson to take, that's the lesson I would take.